Hello and welcome to today's webinar slash live stream. So today we are going to talk all about platform teams. But before we do that, let me introduce who we are. So as you can see, Sarah is already there. I'm Sebastian and we are the founders of Tech Leaders Academy. Tech Leaders Academy is basically the place to be for your tech career progression. So if you are a tech lead, a team lead, a software engineer, data scientist, whatever, and you want to progress in your career, then we do offer specialized trainings for you. Um, if you're interested, check out our website uh, at tech-leaders.academy. And today we have a phenomenal guest with us. And uh, Sarah, I would like to hand it over to you to introduce him. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian. And hi and welcome also from my side. Yeah, um, today's guest is someone that we know already quite some time because we had 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 some chats already and talked about software engineering, DevOps, but also how we could collaborate um, and join forces at Tech Leaders Academy. Actually, we found a way how to collaborate and we will also gonna introduce it to you at the end of our talk. Uh, so stay tuned and stay with us in order to find out more about that. And yeah, this guest that we have with us today, um, he has already quite some experience with software engineering, DevOps, and in IT in general. And um, before he moved into freelancing, he was a tech lead at Brighter. I think he will um, yeah, give us more details on this journey. And now he is a freelance consultant and also coach, and he is helping CTOs and tech organizations in order to improve with um, developer experience, especially, but also with uh, developer productivity. And yeah, I would say um, let him or let's bring him on the stage and let him introduce himself uh, as well. Here is Tobias Mende. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation, Sarah and Sebastian. I'm excited to be here. Hi, Toby. <laughs> nice that hey. you're taking the time and that you're here with us today. Um, it's your first live stream, right? Exactly. Yes. I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> you don't have to. Um, it's normal, but you don't have to. We are, we, we're going to have a quite yeah comfortable uh, conversation about platform teams. And I think that's your main uh, topic that you're dealing with since a couple of months and years already. So maybe before we start into the topic, would you like to also introduce yourself a little bit, maybe also in more detail than that I did? Sure, I can do that. So I'm Tobi, I'm originally from Lübeck in northern Germany. And I started as a software engineer at Draga back then in 20. 15 maybe so quite some time ago and before that I was actually working self-employed um, in IT consulting uh, IT support web development these kind of things and uh, during all my stages in my career I found that one topic always came up how can I improve the experience for developers how can I um, remove the friction that we have in the processes how I can speed up the deployments and all these things that happened again and again I found myself uh, giving trainings in every company I was in uh, about uh, how can we use the tools more efficiently and so on. And uh, also at Brighton, I, when I joined the company, um, it was still a quite small startup actually. I, I realized that some things in the software development process were not as I would like them to be, uh, that there was like um, a handover to a QA team that did the deployments at that time and that they were done manually and only two times a week, for example. And uh, at Bright, I had the opportunity um, to start a team with a handful of other colleagues, um, the platform team for developer experience. Or we called it back then uh, the team for developer experience and platform. That wasn't the best idea that we had, but I will get to that later maybe. And um, with that team, we worked exactly on these topics as a platform team. And we improved the developer experience for all the teams that we had at Bright, and that was quite exciting. Uh, quite fun too and we saw huge impact huge positive impact on the work of uh, our colleagues which is very satisfying work um, and also very valuable work for the company and from that experience with platform teams and developer experience and also leadership topics I decided to start my own consultancy the unblocked engineering 
uh, to help engineering leaders to build high-performing teams and organizations, but always with a human-centric approach. Great. So um, now we know you already dealt with platform teams, developer productivity, developer experience a lot. Um, but to start easy, um, can you explain to us what is a platform team? So for everybody who has never heard of it, what is a platform team actually? Yeah, um, sure. So a platform team, in contrast to a value stream aligned team, is a team that doesn't provide direct customer value. And now people might say, so why do we have them then? Well, they provide value to the developers or to other to employees in general, because we always think about engineering, but it ha doesn't have to be limited to engineering. Um, they provide self-service um, mechanisms and systems so that people in the company can do their job more easily. So for example, um, our developer experience teams provided abstractions around CI, CD, and all the cloud functions so that uh, teams that build features and um, product um, increments can do this without having all the deep knowledge about all the cloud servers, about all the infrastructure, all the Kubernetes stuff, all the GitLab pipelines, and so on, um, and just focus, just focus on on the on the value and the features that need to be built on the customer requests. So platform teams exist to reduce the cognitive load of the value stream aligned teams. All right. When you're talking about value uh, stream aligned teams, I mean uh, we read the uh, team topologies. It's basically a term that comes out of this book um, you could also call them like product team or like a feature team or i mean yeah um, maybe product teams um, feature teams because they don't only develop features of course they will also deal with bug, uh, bug fixes uh, usually they will do other things and they are not focused only around a certain feature but um, around a certain um, value that is delivered to um, customers and you know we want these teams to be um, fully autonomous so that they can deliver value on their own without depending on other teams. So when we look back to the old days and for some companies, it's still reality, you have uh, development teams and then you have other teams downstream like operations teams who deal with the deployment and you have a handover between these teams. So that's something we want to avoid because that means that this feedback loop from the development team builds something pass it on through a process with manual steps and interactions between teams, then eventually it goes live and then they get real customer feedback that it didn't work, then it goes back and all the circle and it's very slow. But if this team can take full control of the whole circle, they get feedback really, really fast from real customers, which is what we want to have, of course. But if they do this, then we need cross-functional teams because now it's not only front-end or not only back-end, but it's both. It's QA, it's operations, it's all these things. So that would be a very big team if you need in-depth knowledge about all of these topics. And that is where platform teams for me come in to provide abstractions around all these complex sub areas of engineering so that it's easier for um, a team to manage the whole circle independently. Could you also provide us with a, maybe with a realistic use case, uh, what you experienced, uh, what were your yeah, tasks and, you, and, and responsibilities at Brighter, for example? Maybe you can, if you are able to talk about that. Um. Uh, yeah, I think I'm able, I hope at least because I already give a talk, gave a talk about that. Uh, so <laughs> for example, uh, one topic is that we introduce continuous deployments at Brighter. So Brighter was the monolithic deployment, a uh, couple of services and front ends, but it was one single deployment and all the teams were working on that topic. So naturally the CI pipeline that put that all together and deployed all of that was a nobody's land kind of. So nobody really had the knowledge and uh, felt really responsible to work on these topics. And that was one of the points where we saw a huge opportunity for our team when we started it to push these things forward, to look into why are the build jobs so slow? Why um, does it take so long to get through the whole pipeline? Why do we have these steps in the process? Why do we have these teams in the process? And uh, then continue we evolved that together with other teams, of course, working together, seeing what is valuable and remove that. So for example, one very concrete, um, very small part of it was that we looked into, okay, why do jobs wait for sometimes 20 minutes? 
And then we saw, okay, because our um, build nodes are at capacity. So obvious solution, just add more build nodes, right? So they cost maybe a couple of hundreds a month, but you save uh, 10,000 a month by uh, developers not waiting. It immediately improves the experience. It reduces the pipeline lead time. And that, that's one very specific thing that you can do that doesn't really fit into the um, responsibility of a single team if it's shared build nodes across all of the teams. So you need somebody to look into that and to also make a case for that because in the end, you need a team that can market that and say, okay, look, we have, we can invest this amount of money of money to save this amount of money and then um, kind of make a business case for that because that's the challenge with all these developer experience topics that it sometimes is, okay, do we really need that? Can we put numbers on that? And um, a team that focuses on that is um, usually much, it's much easier for them to make a case for that. Yeah, that makes totally sense. So how did you came to that role at Rider? Did you start it right ahead in this platform team role or did were you like in a stream aligned team and then found out, okay, there are like potentials to improve and uh, yeah, to save money and to optimize the process? Mm -hmm. Uh, I joined as a normal software engineer, um, mostly focused on backend and in a value stream aligned team. And at that time, we didn't really think about value stream aligned platform teams, enabling teams, all these kind of things. But as the company grew and the number of teams grew, and there was more and more friction about all these shared parts that like CI CD pipelines, but also build tooling, linting, testing, uh, we saw, okay, somehow just meeting with different people from different teams and talking about this doesn't really work. We uh, created a community for tech leadership also, and I became one of the first tech leads, like kind of one of the founding tech leads of that community uh, for that value stream line team. But then in the community, we decided, okay, it would make sense to create such a team. And because I was always curious about these topics, I kind of automatically came into that position that I had the fortune to look for people who could join that team and then we built that team and found out how to work and how to work efficiently. So as I said, we started as the team for developer experience and platform. And then you have kind of in your name, you have two buzzwords, which means you suddenly own everything. And of course, it, we had a hard time to narrow that down to some more specific things by figuring out, okay, what's actually the mission of our team and what are we there for and what don't we do because of platform, then people said, but the abstraction around the blob storage isn't that isn't that platform and what about the virus scanning and the key cloak and oh we have an email service should you own that too mm -hmm. and then we come to another problem if if one team would own all these things then cognitive load very quickly also becomes a problem for that team again so mm. we we narrowed it down to okay everything that affects the software um, delivery process kind of is our our thing everything around onboarding tooling um, deployment, these kind of things, but not the abstractions around these different functions. They are probably more uh, more suitable in value stream aligned teams because also they can provide APIs to their capabilities between each other. Uh, and that's not automatically, it's not automatically a platform concern just because other people use it. <laughs> mm. What I was wondering while you were explaining um, the journey and how you came up with this idea of platform teams is, was it ever um, yeah, like a challenge to convince managers or any other people not closely involved that or people that don't feel this cognitive lo lo load themselves? Um, did you have any challenges? If yes, how did you overcome them? Uh, yes, um, I, I had them many times in, in many situations, and it's not always easy to put a number on it. As soon as you can put a price tag on it, it gets quite easy to convince people because mm -hmm. then you can put it in a, a, a um, in a list sorted by cost, so to say, uh, and say, okay, look, this is super expensive. We are wasting money. We have we have uh, the engineers sitting idle for hours um, a week or sometimes even days and we could save this using doing this or doing that investment then it's almost a no-brainer but if you cannot do that um, it's really hard work also making it more clear sometimes it's not even the manager or um, for example um, 
in our case, VP of engineering or VP of product who, who struggle with understanding that. They, they believe you that it's important and they want to give you the space, but they also need to market it to somebody. So we come more need to connect the technical investment with the business outcome. Hmm. And um, that's always what we tried also with the tech leadership community to, um, to make that very clear because every, every engineer you could ask and they saw an opportunity to improve and we need to see, okay, what's the most valuable improvement right now? I think that's a very valuable advice um, that we also try to uh, get out. If you, as a technology expert, start speaking business language and it could be that you say, okay, we are saving time here. Uh, if we make this investment, uh, that's the best way to talk to management and uh, get your initiatives started. Uh, so I, I would like to underline what you just said. It's uh, great advice. Um, so... I would like to add some comment to the audience. So um, if you like, uh, you can basically drop your questions to Toby um, in the live chat. So if you're watching on YouTube or on LinkedIn, you have a live chat on the right side. Um, feel free to ask your questions. Then we will get it on stage and uh, Toby can answer them. All right. Um, next question, question from my side. So. Uh, when you are talking about platform teams, you're always uh, a lot talking about developer experience, developer productivity. So what do these terms individually mean and how are they distinct? Uh, that, that's a tough one for me, at least, <laughs> um, because I am struggling with that since uh, now two or three years to distinguish them for me. Uh, so when we started this team, I was thinking long time, should we talk about developer productivity or about developer experience? And maybe I've seen some of my blog articles around that topic. Uh, so developer experience to me feels like it's the more human-centric approach. And it says also, it's not only about tools and output, but it's a lot about uh, culture and how people feel. And then when you read some papers, like the paper from Nicole Forsgren about space, the framework for understanding developer productivity, the first thing they talk about is satisfaction and well-being. So that clearly to me is experience. And I think also for them, and what they say is that satisfaction is, the, for example, leading indicator for productivity. So kind of, for me, developer experience is a leading indicator for developer productivity. Um, you can have high developer productivity, like output, however you measure that, for example, like you can have some metrics like story um, story points per per week or commits per day or deployments per, per month. Um, but first of all, that's just output that isn't business outcomes. So it's not really valuable. And second of all, if people can set, um, can compensate for a lot of issues by just pushing harder, by working over hours, by um, doing workarounds, taking technical depth, and you have the same amount of productivity while the team is slowly burning out. And experience is more about how do people feel about their work. And um, that's also about the three dimensions that we saw in the latest paper of, for example, Avi Noda and Nicole Foscreen. And I like these papers because they are so close to what we did in the past um, that um, develop experience is about cognitive load, flow, and feedback loops, right? We talked about this uh, this before. So it's a lot more about cultural aspects. It's a lot more also about psychological safety. And to me, it feels like that's the thing we need to go after. Unfortunately, I think it's not always well understood. I had a, um, a discussion with a CPO who told me, well, we have this developer experience team and now we need to save money. And now my um, venture capital, um, my investors, they ask me, why do you have a team for developer experience? Aren't they paid enough? Mm -hmm. They don't need to have a good time. They just need to be productive. And that was when I thought, okay, maybe we should have called that team developer productivity. But in the end, I think you cannot have one without the other in the long term. So I'm, I'm more to, I'm more about, I'm more, like more talking about developer experience because developer productivity is what follows from that. Yeah, absolutely. We actually uh, got a question regarding the paper that you just mentioned. So um, yes, of course, Enrico, we are going to share that paper uh, afterwards. And uh, yeah. I think there are multiple papers, right, Toby? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, um, 
I, I referred to one that's, I think, from 2021 and to the latest that's from May, I think, Yeah. so this year. And then there's also another one about um, factors for um, developer experience. I forgot the exact title that they are kind of all from the same kind of people, but um, they are all really great to read. So I, I would share all of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank We will you very much. just uh, put it as a reply to your comment, Enrico. And for everybody on YouTube, we will put it in the uh, description. True. Yeah. Um, regarding this um, developer experience and especially with the satisfaction, um, I can imagine it's quite hard <laughs> to measure uh, the impact of developer experience initiatives, especially when it comes to satisfaction and you said that satisfaction is a leading indicator for productivity and so on still productivity is quite difficult to measure right so or there are not the um how to say i think there is not this one metric how to calculate productivity i think there are different ways um do you have any experience how you were able to measure or to evaluate the satisfaction of your developers in the past Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that's maybe one of the reasons why productivity is more often measured because you can get some numbers mm. and numbers give us the strong confidence that what we can measure is more important than what we can't measure. But for example, developer satisfaction or experience or how people feel, you find out by talking to them, by doing surveys, for example, and Mm. by working together with them because What we did a lot of the times as a um, platform team that we didn't only work on our own and provided some service and said, okay, now you have the services, feel free to use them. But we also switched into an enabling mode, worked with people together, gave trainings, but also when there was a problem, jumped on a call together and found out, okay, what's where is, come, is the friction coming from? What, what is frustrating people? So kind of like a user experience, like when you focus on user experience, you, you would observe the users, how they go about certain things. We kind of did the same, but in a more collaborative mode and then found out, okay, this is not good here. We, we can improve this. And uh, that gave us a lot of ideas how where we can improve. So it's difficult maybe to measure in, in concrete numbers. At least um, we, we didn't do that, but um, we, can, we can clearly see a tendency in there. All right. So I guess many organizations departments don't have platform teams yet so that's at least my personal impression um, if a department now thinks about okay it, we might need a platform team um, when should they actually start building a platform team so uh, what are the indicators you talked about that a little bit or what kind of size does an organization or department should have in order to start dealing with this topic mm -hmm. uh so there's only clear one clear answer to that and that is it depends right <laughs> um so that when we look into the team topology book it says you should have like a ratio of six to one or um, nine to one from value streamline team to other teams which can be everything does need to be platform teams but it probably depends on the type of company how much overlap do teams have for example when we are about engineering in terms of technology and uh, what they are working with. And the bigger the overlap, the smaller I think the number of teams can be that a platform team would be worth it. Uh, and as soon as you start to think about some kind of team like an infrastructure team or a QA team or developer experience team, a security team, then it's a good time to think about, could we shape that as a platform team? Would that maybe make more sense? Because one example that we saw at Writer um, which I already um, touched about a bit earlier, was that we had a QA team in the beginning that then did the end-to-end -end test before the deployments happened, and automatically they got this responsibility for the deployments. So we had the development teams kind of, and then the QA team at the end that was busy doing pre-deployment checks, right? So you have what you don't want to have, um, this handover between teams and kind of this slow feedback loop. And then we had um, Maria, which is also part of our fractional DevX team, joining the uh, developer experience team um, to bring the QA experience into that team. And we kind of built a platform for QA, so to say. So we 
we help teams, value streamlined teams to take ownership of their end-to-end -end test. We help, we brought them into the pipelines, automated that, made them more stable together with the other teams. And then that was maintainable by the value streamlined teams. And as soon as you think about these kind of teams um, that are classically like operations, infrastructure, QA, security, um, it's a good time to think about could they maybe work as platform teams or could they at least work a bit more platform-ish, I would say. Do you find companies or tech organizations that have platform teams from your definition, but they don't know it themselves because they don't call it a platform team or maybe they have not, yeah, they, they haven't, read the team topologies and they're not into this methodology of the stream aligned and the platform teams and so on. Um, how could you find or, or what kind of um, factors do you see indicate uh, that it is actually a platform team? Mm, yeah, good question. So there are definitely teams that work more as platform teams, but wouldn't call them that way. So there are infrastructure teams that already work not in the way of, okay, somebody creates a ticket, we solve that ticket and done. Uh, and this kind of relationship, but more, okay, hey, we provide some tool or some, some mechanism so that you can solve your issues yourself. For example, okay, you, you need to deploy a new, a new service. We have an abstraction and it's just a couple of clicks or just running a command and you get the new boilerplate for all the infrastructure as code that you might have and pipeline and so on. And then you can, can use that. Um, so more and more teams, I think, work in that way. And that's not only limited to engineering. Um, for example, to some extent, our legal team at Brighter also worked as a platform team. Um, they, For some requests, of course, you still need to ask them. You need a professional advice. But for many things, they automated contract generation or decision Like can I can I get um, can I take this gift from one of our customers or is that not okay or um, what do I need to do if I want to work from this country and these kind of things um, they build yeah tools auto automation to answer these kind of questions so that people could answer that themselves and platform doesn't always need to be automation and tools it can also be documentation so whenever somebody doesn't need to wait for another team to get their services, but kind of can get that knowledge or that service in a safe service way, then um, that could be like a platform team or a team that works similar to a platform team. Mm -hmm. So And also a data team, data engineering team can also be working as a platform team as long as they don't have that much interactions with stakeholders or if, as long as they don't provide like data value to stakeholders, as long as they provide only the data sources or the data sets, stakeholders can self-service or use by self-service, then you would also name them um, a platform team. Yeah, and I think it's not always black or white. So it's not always, okay, this is clearly a platform team and this clearly is not. I think it's more a gradient and a team can mm -hmm. also become more platform-like. I think what's important is always to think about when I when my team or, or I personally become a blocker for, for other, other teams, how can I avoid becoming that blocker? Because in the end, that slows them down, that slows the company down, that leads to frustration, and nobody likes to wait and um, wait for manual processes or wait for somebody to come back from vacation or these kind of things. So whenever that happens, You could think, how can we platformize these kind of uh, mm -hmm. services? Yeah. Um, so Sarah just uh, said something about like it could be also in the data world. Um, so maybe somebody of the audience is familiar with the data mesh, uh, which is also uh, actually having platform teams inside of this architecture. Um, And we talked a lot about team topologies. And I think it's time to like show everybody what we're actually talking about. Is It's this book. Uh, team topologies and um, I'm not sure Toby maybe you can answer that is this actually the origin of the platform teams term mm. do they coin that term 
I'm not sure if that originally came from them, but they made it far more popular. So platform engineering and so on came up before, probably when more complexity around infrastructure, cloud, and these things came up. That I was okay, we can have platform as a service, we can have abstractions as like service offering for other companies. But then at some point, people realized, okay, that could also be valuable inside of a company. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, that became this clear distinction between value streamlined teams and platform teams, I at least have it from the team topologies book. Yeah. And they actually describe also these uh, stream aligned teams that you were talking about in the beginning uh, or value stream aligned teams um, and how the, they interact with the platform teams. Exactly what you were talking about before that they don't throw the work over and you have to like wait for others. Uh, they are actually promoting that all the teams should be Uh, have the highest autonomy as possible and the platform team should basically pave the way for the other teams so they can be most productive. Yeah, exactly. And there's another important aspect to that um, and it's also in the book, but um, I call it don't be the police. As a platform team, you cannot prescribe the way how other teams do it. You can recommend a way, you can say, okay, this is the way we support, but if you have other ideas, other options, then feel free to do that. For example, okay, we have abstractions around uh, CI, CD using GitLab, but if for some reason you say GitHub is the better choice for us, please go ahead, but we can't help you there. Um, that's, that's completely fine. Um, and that's, I think, also important to have the autonomy. So using the platform, uh, the, the product that is offered by the platform team is always a choice, or yeah. at least should be. We got a comment from Dan. Um, Hi, Dan. He said uh, they might not be a team, but they're uh, they're all uh, they are always at least platform people. I think that is regarding our talk. If or uh, Sarah's question, if there is no platform team that has the name platform team, um, and I think yeah, we can agree to that, right? It could be like a single platform engineer. Is that does it make sense? Mm. I'm not sure if I understand that already. Um, maybe Dan can a bit elaborate. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it could start as one, but I wonder if if it's good to like on anything literally to to work as a single person, mm -hmm. um, because then you don't have the like a second a second brain to think about topics to discuss topics, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, also to have somebody when somebody's on vacation and these kind of things. So I would say it makes sense to, to have a team and maybe it's a team that only works part-time on that topic. Yeah. So what I experienced, especially in the DevOps um, context, that they the teams start to uh, promote single people in like this DevOps role and they're responsible for all deployment pipelines and they are taking like kind of this soft responsibility of being a platform engineer or being like, The, the, the single-headed uh, platform team and taking responsibility for that. Um, yeah. So, oh, I think we lost Toby. <laughs> <laughs> we lost Toby. I already uh, recognized the poor internet connection. Again, the second time, the second <laughs> live stream webinar and we lost our guest, but he's back. <laughs> Hi, Toby. Hi, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> It can happen. We also had that with Tino last or two weeks, weeks ago. ago. <laughs> All right. That's live. <laughs> yeah. So I, I just said um, from my experience that happens to uh, like smaller teams that start up building out the responsibility for DevOps. So there becomes one person becomes like the DevOps engineer or the delivery manager, whatever you want to call it. And they are basically starting to get their way to a platform team or to this platform responsibility, but like only on a technology, uh, on a te technology basis. And I think if you want to build up on that, it could be a platform team later on, but it's like getting the first steps into that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, usually these kind of topics, as long as the company is small enough, they are handled by individuals more or less randomly maybe or the people who have who see the problem first solve it first uh, but at some point there's too much um 
yeah, too, just too much topics to, to figure out, okay, what should, do we need to work on first? And then, of course, value streamline teams always have a certain pressure also to deliver things. And then it's like, okay, if I change that, I need to talk to the other teams. And um, platform teams have a more focused approach on that topic. So, and naturally, these, these people who are doing this before, they then tend to move into such a, a platform team, I would say. Yeah. And we got another question from Enrico again. And I think this fits quite well to, to what we just uh, discussed. So would it make sense to create a platform community within the company as a first step to demonstrate the value of such topics so that in the future one could, all, uh, could justify the need to create a full-fledged team about it? So basically getting the way to the platform team. Mm -hmm. mm. Good question. Um, I'm actually thinking about is it a, would it be a platform community, and and what does it mean? Is, uh, like platform to me is more about the way of working, um, but it could be that it's a part time kind of part time team with a couple of M, um, uh, engineers from various teams, and that they they work together on these topics. Uh, and Rico maybe remembers that we did something similar at Brighter um, as well, um, like. Uh, I can't remember how we called them, but when we worked on improvements in front end, for example, um, there were these kind of teams. So um, that could could make sense, at least also to highlight that there are these topics that remain unaddressed and that there is a need to address them. Um, yeah, it probably also depends on the context. I can also add uh, some statement to that because in the stream that I had at Uh, Tech Rules Uncovered together with Martin Lechner from Personio. He's also a lead platform engineer right now. He mentioned that he started to work with platform engineer or to deal with the topic in general um, at a previous company. And there they built some kind of a part-time group. And they, I don't know, maybe they figured out that they have a problem and there were some people. And I think that's exactly what Dan also meant with his comment. There are always some people that are dealing with the or that, that figure out that there are problems, processes are missing, or uh, tooling are missing, infrastructure abstractions are missing, and then they group together and they are start working on it. Even though they don't have the full responsibility or accountability for this topic, I think this can also be some kind of a danger for them. But still, I think oftentimes it starts in this direction that some people feel intrinsically motivated to... Um, improve some processes uh, in the development department. And mm -hmm. one thing to add from my side, I think it could start like in a center of competence or center of excellence or community of practice. So whatever you want to call it, different organizations give the different names and yeah, also deal with it in a different way. But it's always good like to start uh, getting these topics up, talk about them and understand the uh, business value of having responsibilities or having like platform teams in particular uh, to deal with certain situations, especially if you reach a certain size. And this is exactly what you said, Toby, right? If you have a certain size, it just makes sense to have these teams in place. Yeah. Yeah, and then then also for, for various topics, right? It doesn't make to have sense, doesn't always make sense to have just a single platform team that takes care of all the needs of all the teams. Uh, for example, at Brighter, we also had a, a team for the design system. Uh, and that was kind of a self-service thing. So they provide the UI components that other teams could use to build their front ends uh, so that everything looked kind of similar, but that um, they still were autonomous. And of course, if a team needed a component that wasn't there yet, they could build this. And that's also some important aspect of developer experience teams or of platform teams in general, that the platform also can be open to be extended by other people. So one thing that, for example, crucial in developer experience is don't wait for the platform team. Like if it's important to you and you see an issue there, improve that by all means. It's not that this is the only team that is allowed to work on that topic, but other teams or other communities can work on topics as well. And uh, one thing that we had very often when people started to work on something with new technology that we didn't have yet 
they of course came to us and asked, okay, do you have something for that? Or um, can, can you provide something? And often we said, actually, at the moment, it's not a priority. We see that it's an interesting topic and it could be very valuable. So keep us in the loop. Um, but at the moment, that's not, not something that we would provide, but make do your um, experiments, make the experience to start to work with that. And if you see it works, then we are happy to to make it a bit more general and roll it out to all the other teams. So um, we did that in, in the front end, I think, with um, the build tool. And we moved away from Webpack. But before we did this on a, on a wider scope, um, some teams did experiments with that. And um, from that experience, we saw okay, it would be valuable to integrate that and to bring it to other teams as well. Great. Really cool. We uh, got another question. I would like to add that uh, right away. Um, it's um, how does do not be the police fit together with strong governance needs of enterprises? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a really great question. And to be honest, I don't have a really good answer to that. Uh, it's always a trade-off between having full autonomy in everything and having to deal with some limitations and reality. You know, um, I, like of course all, the team should have all the freedom they have, but then in the end, they still should not have full time, full access to production, for example. And they need to satisfy certain standards, um, especially if it's like about compliance and these things. So, um, yeah, in, in that. In that case, it's probably more important to clearly communicate what are the limitations of the autonomy, where where can we not go around some certain aspects. But um, that sometimes is, uh, for example, when we talk about developer experience, sometimes there are ways to be compliant with certain standards in a developer-friendly way. So, for example, at Brighter, we had a security team. They were also uh, dealing with compliance. and um, they uh, and the company wanted to become SOC 2 compliant. So they naturally came with a lot of standards and said, okay, this and this and this and this. And then we said, okay, this and this and this sounds good for compliance, but it's horrible for developer experience. So how can we find a way that we can, how can we sell it that we are still compliant, but have great developer experience? And for example, one thing we came up with, not the developer experience team, but actually the security and compliance team Uh, was, okay, of course, nobody should have full-time access to production environments, but still we need it. So the first idea was, okay, then people can do ask this request to get to get access if they need it in case of an incident, and then we will just approve it. And then we said, yeah, but then there is a bottleneck of two people of a small team that could be not there when we need the access. It's still not really great. Do we really need your team to approve that? Wouldn't it make more sense if another developer could approve that because they understand what's going on there and could maybe say, is that a reasonable request and we can document that and so on. And then we said, yes, it's okay. So that way we were able to remove all the production access. But if somebody really needed it, they provided a reason, somebody else reviewed and said, yes, that, that's really needed now. Then it was there for an hour or so, and then it was automatically removed. So um That's a good example, but I'm not sure if that actually answered that question, to be honest. So basically, it's it's a lot about drawing lines, finding good collaboration or interaction patterns between teams, not blocking one another, mm -hmm. and basically giving everybody full autonomy. And if that means uh, governance has to be respected, then um, it could be governance that is a streamlined team has to deal with. It could also be governance that the platform team is dealing with. I mean, it, I think it can happen to all teams and it can also happen at the interface or at the interaction between teams. But um, it could be, for example, governance that we say, you, you brought that topic with uh, GitHub and GitLab. could be like, okay, we have uh, contracts that we don't want to use GitHub for a certain reason. Maybe let's say Copilot is the reason we want to use GitLab instead. Um, mm -hmm. Then it's maybe something the platform team has to deal with and um, maybe has to bring into the stream aligned teams, uh, their value stream aligned teams. Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, 
I'm not I'm not sure if I understood that uh, that completely. Um but I mean if you are limiting the the tools that are able to use. So if you say, okay, we want to have like a certain tool being used or we want to promote that to the organization or governance says we are not allowed to use a certain tool, then that, this could be supported by the platform team actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And then it's also there, I think it's, of course, then you, you don't have the full freedom uh, and you have somebody who, who um, yeah, who needs to tell, to say sorry, but we cannot use this kind of tool. Um, but then again, that's not really the maybe the platform team, but it's the the, the governance that yeah. gives the restriction. And the platform team, if it plays a role, it can then communicate what is the restriction, why is it there, and depending on what it is, also challenge challenge the restriction and say, look, but it would be really valuable. Are we really sure we cannot do mm -hmm. this, or is there? Is there a, a limitation to that? For example, um, yeah, we cannot use Datadoc because for whatever reason, um, but it would be huge benefit for the company to use that. So what are the reasons why we cannot use it? And then it's yeah, actually because we don't write it here and there. And then <laughs> the customer is, okay, but could we write it there? <laughs> and then, of course, you talk with other teams, you talk with them with legal and so on to see what do we need to do in order to use that tool or what are the limitations for using the tool and very often you find a way um, that you will still satisfy the restrictions that you have uh, in the surroundings that you have but find a good way to do this and if not then yeah then then it is sometimes even the reality but i find most of the time when especially when it comes to compliance and to standards and so on that a lot of people tend to say no we cannot do this because of the standard But when you read the standard, you don't understand where the standard says that the it's more the interpretation of the standard and it's one way to be compliant with the standard. But there are other ways. And as soon as you get talking with people, you find better ways around that. And then you have the, the compliance, but you also have um, a good experience. Yeah, I have one more additional question that is really like I really want to <laughs> get that answered. Uh, so, Toby, um, I was wondering if you imagine your team at Brighter, the platform team, uh, did you all, like the team members, did you all had um, a specific seniority level already in order to be able to provide the services for other developers? Or do you think it's independent of any kind of seniority? Um, well, for our team, the developer experience team, it definitely helped that everybody on the team was really, really good and a super senior, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and also that they had experience in the company before mm -hmm. and um, knew the other teams. Um, helps also with um, yeah, suggesting uh, new ways of trying things because people know, okay, the people are with the company for some time. They, they know about the issues. They, we know them. We trust them. Um, and that's a mutual mutual trust there. And also, like especially developer experience, but also for other platform teams that are, have a more broader scope, the number of tools and technologies that you are dealing with is not exactly small. So, um, and that means you are finding yourself working with new technologies on a daily basis. So it really helps when you have seen a bit and can, can pick that up quickly. Uh, But if you have a more, like if you have a, a good core team uh, with higher seniority, I don't see a reason why you couldn't onboard juniors to that. But of course, that's like with any team, it's always easier um, when everybody has a good uh, seniority already or high seniority already. All right. Um, before we uncover uh, what uh, we are basically working on together, um, Toby, could you? Um, wrap it up and maybe sum, summarize why should people care why should organizations care about platform teams so what what is the motivation to start a platform team to maintain platform teams could you like um, summarize that again yeah uh, so uh, when you see that um, various teams deal with the same struggles and um, that they deal with things that are not exactly about the feature delivery or about the value that they create for customers, but about all the technology around. 
for example, linting, testing, infrastructure, CI, CD, then maybe it's a good time to, to start thinking about that. Um, as long as it's just one team, maybe that's the case in the startup, then, then it's, you probably don't need such a team. But as soon as it gets bigger and more teams struggle with that and are slowed down by that, then it's good time to have such a team to leverage these cross-team synergies there um, by providing the safe service capabilities. All right. Thank you very much for that. Um, and now um, I'm coming back to what Sarah was mentioning in the beginning. So um, we have an announcement and it's basically that Toby is offering a workshop about platform teams at Tech Leaders Academy. So if you are interested to get more information about how to build a platform team yourself or how to improve your platform team, um, then it's the best way to sign up for the waitlist for this course. Um, just go to tech-leaders.academy and you will find the course on the... Uh, it's right the first course on the website, so you cannot miss it. <laughs> and um, if you're interested in this course, uh, which is hosted by Toby, then um, yeah, sign up for the waitlist and um, then we will notify you as soon as as the first cohort is starting or as the first workshop is taking place. Um, yeah, that's it basically from my side. Sarah, uh, Toby, would you like to add something? I can add, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, sure. like, let, me, let, let me talk first and then Toby will have the last words. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we're not 100% ready with a workshop yet. So uh, that's why... Um, there will we will have the waitlist first, uh, and as soon as we are ready and we're gonna kickstart it, then um, yeah, you're gonna be notified by us um, about the dates and everything else, so you can register there right now. Um, for, just from my side, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I have never worked with a platform team, but I was wondering if that's true actually, because I learned today that it's a lot more. Uh, than I used to think. So you talked about this legal team, which was quite impressive to, to see it also as a platform team. And um, I think uh, I have to think about it even further where I probably have uh, had the opportunity to, to meet a platform team already. And I think there might be some, um, but I don't know right now. However, um, thank you very much, Toby, uh, for taking the time for giving us all the insights for introducing us into developer productivity uh, experience and platform teams especially. So um, maybe we are going to do another webinar in the future. Uh, if you have any feedback for us, any comments, any more questions, please drop it in the chat or write us a DM on LinkedIn or on our website. And then we are happy to take that feedback um, for the next time. And now, Toby, I will hand it over to you for the last words. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, for having me here. That was really fun. I, I was nervous, but still, uh, I enjoyed it. And um, I, I always like to talk about platform teams, as everybody might have noticed now. And I also, and even more, like to talk about developer experience and developer productivity. And actually, in engineering, you cannot really distinguish these things really well because every platform team adds to developer experience and productivity. But I also have um, a free online workshop, just one hour, developer experience um, demystified for engineering leaders, where I actually touch on that topic or go deep on that topic of developer experience and how can engineering leaders uh, impact that and um, what do they need to know about this topic, uh, which happens on the 11th of July. And I think we can also share the LinkedIn yeah. event um, in the comments. Yeah, we will we will also, um, that, but I'm not sure if we should announce this, but maybe I can just do it. Yeah, we will also, uh, with the Tech Leaders Academy, have a um, full workshop on developer experience as well at some point. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting. And I'm looking forward to see you all there. And thank you. Yeah, just thank to add from much. my side, we are preparing this uh, right now, what uh, he just said. So it's not on the website yet. It will be there. But for everybody who's uh, signing up for the waitlist, um, you will get a 15% discount just to mention that. So if you sign up early, um, then you will get this discount. And Sarah, I interrupted you. Sorry. No, I interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay, then uh, let's finish it at this time. Thank you very much, all. Thank you very much, audience. See you next time and have a great evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.